Coming up on Great Lakes Now, exploring the least visited U.S. national park. You can see the moose right through this brush right here. It has two babies, so we're being careful to not get too close because moose will charge if they feel like their babies are threatened. Taking the helm with a Great Lakes freighter pilot. We actually are in the public interest. We protect the environment and we promote the smooth flow of commerce. And news from around the lakes. All right. Well, hello and welcome to another Great Lakes Now episode watch party. This time it's a little bit less of a preview and more of a premiere party. Um, so anyway, I'm Anna Seisling, host of Great Lakes Now, and I am really grateful to you for tuning in. We have a really great watch party in store for you tonight. As you just saw a little sneak peek of there, we are going to be highlighting our segment that took place at Isle Royal National Park, taking a look at the wolves and the moose and the researchers who study both of those species and how they relate to the larger ecosystem on the island. A really incredible segment, and I'm so excited to share it with you. We've got a lineup of some really knowledgeable guests who are going to be joining a little bit later to answer all of your questions and to answer some of my questions, too. I also want to make sure that I welcome our other Watch Party co-hosts who are streaming this event with us. And as always, I'm so excited to bring your voice into the conversation. But first, let's check out the feature segment all about Isle Royal National Park. For more than 60 years, a team of researchers has kept a close eye on a remote island in Lake Superior, studying the moose and wolves who live there. Great Lakes Now correspondent Ian Solomon traveled to Isle Royal National Park to experience it firsthand. Let me tell you guys, I am up super early to catch the Isle Royal Queen Ford. The ferry will be departing at 8 a.m. sharp to carry us out to the island. First, I load my massive backpack onto the boat, and then I make a beeline for the cafe. Thank you. You too. I need to fuel up with a breakfast sandwich and, of course, coffee for the long journey. We leave the dock in Copper Harbor, Michigan, at the northernmost tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula, which juts way out into Lake Superior. It takes almost four hours by boat to get to Isle Royal, the country's least visited national park, because of its remote location. The island is actually surrounded by 450 smaller islands, with a total area of 850 square miles. During the ferry ride to the island, I can't stop taking photos and videos. All around me is this amazing natural beauty. The boat pulls up to the dock, and I immediately get to work setting up my tent. I'm here at Isle Royal. Just got off a nearly four hour ferry ride, but guys, I am so excited to be here. I mean, we got my tent set up here with a nice water view over this ridge. And honestly, I just can't get over how ancient this place feels. I mean, the trees are huge. You have berries everywhere. There are wildflowers just springing up from every point they can. It feels incredibly untouched and I just cannot wait to explore. I've reviewed my maps and it's time to finally hit the trail. Isle Royal is known for its population of moose and wolves. I don't know if I want to come face to face with the wolf, but I definitely want to see a moose. I stopped several times to take photos of all the plants and trees and just soak it all up. I've come here to learn everything I can about the unique ecosystem. Isle Royal received an International Biosphere Reserve designation in 1980, and I can see why. Did you see the moose droppings, Aaron? Normally, droppings aren't really my thing, but that's how bad I want to see a moose. And then, not too far into our hike, it happens. So, you can see the moose right through this brush right here. It has two babies, so we're being careful to not get too close because moose will charge if they feel like their babies are threatened. Um, but I'm amazed right now, like I'm losing my ish. <laughs> So far, I can say this, Isle Royal does not disappoint. Yeah. 
It's day two. After spending the night in my cozy little tent, I head over to a place called Bangs and Cabin. I've come here to meet Rolf Peterson and his wife Candy. For more than 50 years, they've spent their summers here studying wolves and moose. Looks like a different kind of device. What's it's that? Polaroid. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Threw it all go. the way back, right? That's <laughs> way back. Uh, so, yeah. uh, do you well, need a place, a dry place to put something down? Rolf is a research professor at Michigan Tech University. He's the lead researcher on the long-running Wolf Moose Project, which is studying the predator-prey interaction between moose and wolves. So I just wanted to, you know, get an understanding of where did the study begin and why? How oh, it began in the mid 20th century, the darkest period for wolves in North America, worldwide actually, after several years of lead up to try to figure out in a place where people weren't killing wolves, what do wolves really do in nature? That's the simple start and that's still what we're doing. And so what are some of the methods of data collection? What is the process like? Well, our main, our main objectives for science each year are how many wolves are there, how many moose are there, and how many moose are the wolves killing. So what's their predatory effect? And that's done primarily from aircraft in the winter, light aircraft. New scientific tools have been game changers. GPS allows Rolf's team to pinpoint the exact locations of moose and wolves, and a DNA analysis revealed serious inbreeding in the island's wolf population. And there were some serious problems in their, in their spine. Every wolf had spinal defects, extra vertebrae, asymmetrical vertebrae, things that would cause problems if it was your dog, pain, inability to move appropriately. The population needed new blood, literally, but the Park Service had a dilemma. Should they bring in new wolves to help the wolf population recover, or should they let nature take its course and keep the research pure? Eventually, in 2018, the decision was made, and 19 wolves were brought in from the mainland and released on Isle Royal. I was snooping around a little bit, sorry. <laughs> and I noticed this an another amazing array of bones, and more specifically bones with these huge antlers on them. Oh, uh, yeah. Near Rolf's cabin is an amazing collection of moose bones. For him, it's a treasure trove of information. In collecting these skulls and moose, you know, what are you looking for? What is, uh, where's the information points coming from? Oh, well, we get basic demographics, age and sex of, of each moose. The sex comes from, you know, the bulls have antler pedestals, bases. Uh, the age comes from pulling a tooth and coming cementum lines, cementum annulations in the teeth, in the roots. And then beyond that, we're, we're looking for any indicator of health. Could you show me if there are any like health indications on any of these skulls? Oh, you bet. Um, there's three big pathologies that we see in moose. Uh, one is osteoporosis, which uh, is indicated by these lesions, these thinning areas. Moose also develop periodontal disease. That's gum disease. Just like uh, we do in people, gum disease, not because they don't brush their teeth, because they never brush their teeth. But <laughs> Finally, also like humans, moose can develop arthritis. Before moose on Isle Royal, that's a major problem. This is a death sentence if you're living with wolves. Wolves can detect any kind of an abnormality in moose, and they're looking for abnormalities, which make them more vulnerable to predation. The average lifespan of a moose on Isle Royal is about 10 years, and for wolves, it's only about four and a half years. I want people who come to Isle Royal to leave with their faith in humanity restored. Rolf's wife Candy has also been studying wolves and moose for decades, but with a more philosophical viewpoint about nature and the role that humans play. What I hope people realize is, when you hear that phrase, let nature take its course, don't write people out of nature. We are needed as never before. Candy says humans need to learn from their mistakes and then get to work fixing the problems we've created. We are a caring animal. We care about other species, we are amazing. We just haven't lived up to our potential because we've bought into 
the part of us that's also greedy and selfish and frightened. So we have to overcome that. The healing nature of nature, it's in us all, and uh, we need to trust it and work with it and bring it out of one another. Thank you. We say our goodbyes to Candy and Rolf and then hop on our little boat to explore some of the other surrounding islands. Oh my God, there's a lighthouse. This is crazy. And as we're headed back to Rock Harbor to catch the ferry to the mainland, we see this. That's an actual moose in the water. I mean, this is our now third moose sighting. I I'm speechless, like, and it's a moose swimming. I've never, <laughs> I didn't even know moose could swim before coming here, so. I'm just so grateful. This has been amazing. It has been a boost full trip. From its incredible wildlife to its incredibly knowledgeable and passionate people, I understand why they say Isle Royal is the least visited, most revisited national park. All right. Wow. A mooseful trip indeed. So before we start unpacking everything that we just saw and talking with our guests, I want to make sure that I also let folks know that you can go to greatlakesnow.org and check out our new episode landing page. There's all kinds of really cool extras, links, and even more resources about that story and the other ones that are a part of our newest episode of Great Lakes Now. And also I should let you know that Great Lakes Now always has lessons plans that are based on segments from the show. They are standards aligned. They're great for teachers. They're great for kids. If you are interested in learning about conservation, the environment, fish, you name it. You can find all of the lesson plans related to the show over at greatlakesnow.org slash education. I also want to make sure that I welcome people who are tuning in to let us know where they're watching from, if they have comments, questions, stories about a trip maybe that you've taken to Isle Royal, anything that you are thinking about after seeing that segment uh, over at Isle Royal National Park can drop those comments and questions into the chat and know that I will work those in as we go. Uh, we do have Dr. Rose Moten, who says, fascinating. Karen says, this Minnesota girl is watching in Southwest Missouri. Rose, uh, who is in Hazel Park, Michigan, and says, wow, amazing. So, uh, you can be like them. I will mention your name, your comment, where you're watching from. You can leave all that good stuff in the chat. All right. So without further ado, let's bring our guests in. So first up, we have a familiar face from that segment you just saw. We have Dr. Rolf Peterson, who is a researcher, professor emeritus for Michigan Tech's College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science. Rolf is also the co-lead on the world's longest running wildlife study, which is, of course, the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project. Rolf, it is great to have you with us. Thanks for joining. Good to be here. We also have Sarah Hoy, who is a wildlife researcher at Michigan Tech University's College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science. And Sarah is the co-lead on the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project. Sarah, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And then lastly, another familiar beloved face, we have Ian Solomon, a Great Lakes Now contributor, founder of Amplify Outside. Of course, you just saw Ian on that Isle Royal segment. Ian, it is great to talk with you. Thanks for having me. Great as always. Absolutely. So, all right. We know that we're obviously going to get into some stuff with Ian and Rolf, but I want to start with Sarah, since Sarah was not featured in that segment we just saw, but Sarah's very much an integral piece of the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project. Um, so tell me a little bit, Sarah, about your role in this research project and, you know, just kind of your your background. How long have you been a part of it and what is sort of the, the piece that you play in this? Yeah. Um, so I like Rolf, I spend time out working on the island every year, trying to collect data and working with the different teams that we have. Um, we spend time both in winter and also in the springtime. In the winter time, we're doing a lot of work from uh, aircrafts, so doing aerial surveys to estimate the number of moose on the island. We want to see how many wolves there are, how many packs there are you know, which individuals are breeding, how many pups have survived, 
how many moose are being killed, things like that. And then we also work with a really amazing ground crew that help us collect samples for genetic analysis to help us monitor the populations that way. They track down moose that have GPS collars so we can get samples from them to figure out how healthy those individuals are and if they've had calves. Um, then in the summertime, um, spring, summertime, we have big teams of volunteers who come out to the island to help us find the bones of, of moose that have died um, and also collared animals that have maybe died during the winter. And we have a, a teams of undergraduate students that we help collect data to, to help us monitor the impact that moose are having on the forest mm. um, and also spend time collecting data to figure out how badly moose are impacted by parasites called winter ticks. Okay. And then when I'm not on the island, I'm at Michigan Tech um, and we're supervising students in the lab, helping to organize data um, catalog or, and process all the samples that we collect and get data from them. Um, and then the rest of the time, I'm, I'm kind of crunching numbers, analyzing data and writing scientific papers and reports um, and working on proposals to, to fund future research efforts. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm curious, I want to ask you this question. And then I also, um, I think I, I might want to also jump over to Rolf to get his take on it. So obviously, you know, the reintroduction of wolves in the 2018, 2019 season, like that was a big deal. I think, you know, not even necessarily just in the science and sort of like conservation and national park world, but I think there's something obviously about wolves being this really charismatic species and their ability to sort of capture the attention of the public. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that was like in relation to your research. And since then, if you can speak to the ways that the reintroduction of wolves um, on the island, um, or I shouldn't say reintroduction of wolves, but bringing some new wolves onto the island, rather, the ways that that has impacted the sort of like ecosystem from your view. And then, like I said, I'd love for Rolf to respond after. Yeah, I mean, it, it really was a very big deal. I think if it hadn't happened, then I don't think there'd be wolves on the island anymore. And I think it's really important that it happened is because Isle Royal is one of the few places in the world where wolves can just be wolves. There's no conflict with farmers worried about livestock being killed. There's no conflict with hunters. There's no worries about anybody's pets being killed. None of those those potential issues apply. Um, and so, you know, it really is a special place where wolves can just be wolves and 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 do what they do. And our world is also one of the few places in the world where you can study wolves and see the impacts that they have on prey populations and ecosystems where the wolves aren't being hunted, the moose aren't being hunted, the forest isn't being harvested in any way. So it's really like a snapshot of, of what the world looks like when there aren't really uh, Im important human impacts on the landscape. Hmm. Thanks for that um, that analysis and perspective. I am curious, um, Rolf, I'd love to bring you in to sort of respond to that too. I know that there were obviously so many things that we talked about, um, me, you, Ian, um, of course, like Aaron Peterson and the other folks, all the all the behind the scenes folks who were there too. Um, there was so much good stuff, I think, you know, that we were able to get into that didn't necessarily make it into that feature. But can you speak to, from your perspective, being involved in this study for like, you know, over half a century at this point, what did it mean for you in relationship to your research and understanding of the ecosystem on the island um, to see the introduction of some new wolves to the island? Well, it was a, it was a total reset, of course, of the of the wolf population. And as Sarah said, if if it hadn't been done, wolves would probably not be there. And I suspect the research would have ended too, because uh, we don't really need to study places without apex carnivores they're all over the place <laughs> and mm -hmm. so we not sort of know what happens but they it uh, raises the question of course what what next what will these wolves do will it be just a, a recreation of what's been going on for the last half century or 70 years actually or will it be a a totally new arrangement of wolves and moose and vegetation uh and it's i, I expect to be surprised actually i don't think it's just going to be a return to the way things used to be. 
Hmm. But I don't. Well, I mean, it it rarely is, right? And that was something that I think was really profound for me, anyway, in um, working on this story with you all. Um, was the, what you said about there sort of is no equilibrium; it just keeps changing, and documenting it is like such an important, I think, part for not just um, you know the work and sort of understanding of Isle Royal, but really to what we can all learn collectively about how wolves can impact an ecosystem because I mean this being the longest running study I imagine there's a lot of people probably sort of looking at this right and like you're working with people in other places so Rolf I wonder if you can talk a little bit about from your view like the impact that this study and just sort of its longevity has had on the larger scientific community um well it's it's sort of the the grand old grand old research project for most most wolf and moose researchers um and they uh it's sort of the, uh, a standard in many ways for what uh research can be and should be and if long-lived animals are involved uh, i think actually it's it's uh effect on the public has perhaps been more important or at least as important uh we have to think back to the 1950s and 1960s uh, most of the wolves in the world that existed at that time were in Russia and Canada, Soviet Union and Canada. And uh, as the research was, uh, in many cases, translated into other languages, it became known around the world, and it really challenged people's ideas about wolves. And it it led to, a, in some way, to a renaissance in public attitudes about wolves, which led to the recovery of wolves surprisingly uh mm -hmm. in a in a in a worldwide sense this is the okay. this is the toughest creature that we've ever had to deal with and yet it it recovered in the midst of all six billion of us it's pretty incredible. Um, and I want to make sure for folks who are just tuning in that I welcome everybody into the conversation. Um, so obviously, you came to the Great Lakes Now episode premiere watch party. If you have any questions for our incredible researchers about wolves, moose, and how um, the role that both of those species play within the ecosystem on Isle Royal National Park, you can drop those comments or questions into the chat and I will work them in as we go. Um, also, if you just want to let us know, like, Clara and Grand Rapids, where you are watching from and what your name is, I can drop those uh, or I can work those comments into the conversation too. Um, Roz says, great feature. Thank you so much, Roz. Um, so, all right. I, I also want to bring Ian into the conversation here in uh, just, just a minute to sort of get a uh, Ian's thoughts on this. And maybe I'll do that since I'm looking at Ian right now. So Ian, I wonder if you, like me, watching that segment made you just like, oh my God, can we just go back in time and go back on the island? What are your thoughts? Yes, I was I was melting watching it. I was like, oh my God, it's just, it was so much fun. And it was just bringing back all the memories of just, it, it felt like just three days being completely in awe and then learning all this amazing research on top of it and seeing three moose, knowing that like we talked to people on the uh, on the island who had been there a week and hadn't seen like any moose or multiple weeks and hadn't seen any. So to see one every single day and learn about them, it was just a reminder of how special that was. Absolutely. And, you know, to that point, I kind of, Sarah, I'm curious, I want to ask you, so like that part of the story that we saw there um, with Rolf showing Ian some of the bones on the island and being able to sort of point out the different features, I know, you know, in you sort of describing the work that you do, so much of that I think is like, kind of documenting and putting into forms and sort of like formats that are shareable and can be archived, like, what these bones are telling us about the health of the population. So how do you go about like translating what we're seeing on bones into research and paperwork? Can you talk a little bit about your, your process sort of turning what feels very tangible and physical into kind of measurable data points? Yeah, we have. Um, so the bones kind of all get cleaned and they get properly labeled. And then we have teams of students that take certain measurements and things like that. Rolf goes through and scores all of the different pathologies, you know, has it got slight arthritis, severe arthritis? And then we compile all of that information into this huge database that has, you know, five data on over 5,000 di different moose that have died on the island over the last few decades. 
And then we use that data in various ways for scientific analysis. So currently, earlier this week, we just submitted a paper that we've been working with some medical doctors who study arthritis in humans, looking at different links between the various diseases like periodontal disease and arthritis and osteoporosis. Um, and that research showed that moose that have the gum disease, the dental disease, tend to be much more likely to get severe forms of osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Um, and it can be really difficult to look at the links between those diseases in human populations because humans have a lot of uh, what's called confounding risk factors. So they maybe eat unhealthy diets, they smoke cigarettes, they have alcohol, they maybe have other, you know, uh, things like diabetes that impact their health and the likelihood of getting diseases. So in humans, it's quite complicated to try and tease apart what factors are causing these relationships. Whereas in the moose population, they're not smoking or drinking alcohol or anything like that. So it makes it a lot easier to, to kind of figure out the links between some of these relationships. That's pretty fascinating. And yeah, I mean, although we're not seeing moose smoking cigarettes, <laughs> I think that there are still sort of environmental health issues, right? And like, so I wonder what can we learn about sort of the overall health of the ecosystem um, in looking at, you know, maybe some of like these uh, illnesses or um, diseases that are showing up that we can sort of see in in the moose, whether it's the, the teeth or the bones, like what, I guess I'm wondering, like you mentioned, like the tick. Um, I also wonder if there are things that we might be able to infer in relation to, uh, you know, a warming climate and the way that that can be sometimes changing an ecosystem or a food source. Like, can you talk a little bit about sort of how those dots connect? And maybe, um, Sarah, if you have thoughts, and then I want to, um, I'm curious too, to hear from Rolf on this one. Um, yeah, when you're talking about, uh, and this is maybe something better for Rolf to talk about, but there was a study kind of using the, the teeth of the moose, looking at uh, heavy metal, that gets in the environment and how that then gets taken up by organisms like moose and gets deposited in their teeth. And so some research that was done a, a while ago showed that with the um, Clean Water and Air Act, then the reduction that that caused in terms of heavy metal depositions, that showed up as a decline in the deposition of mercury in the teeth of moose and things like that. So for sure, these bones can be used to, to kind of look at changes in environmental conditions. And then we've also more recently done um, a lot of work looking at the impacts of climate warming, specifically on moose. We know that following warmer years, moose tend to be in poorer health. Um, so poor in nutritional condition. They also tend to be impacted more by uh, winter ticks, these parasites, um, because warmer conditions kind of can uh, promote faster development of these parasites and enables them to be kind of active for longer periods of time. So, yeah, we are seeing the effects of climate warming on moose um, and, and moose particularly because they're a large bodied cold adapted species that that's not expected to do very well as the climate warms. Okay. Yeah. Rolf, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Um, I guess I'd just highlight another one of these pathologies, which is arthritis, which is, um, you know, a major crippling disease of people and the causes of it in people, if you've avoided sports injuries, uh, are not very well understood. I suspect, uh, Maybe I'll live long enough to find out, but uh, they, uh, there might be both genetic reasons for the high arthritis rate in Iowa moose, as well as environmental reasons uh, that relate to the nutrition of individuals. Uh, we did establish that moose that were born to poorly nourished mothers, if they survive and grow up to be old moose, those moose have more arthritis. And that's an that's a experiment that obviously would never happen in people. And it uh, challenges fundamentally what we know about arthritis, even in people. 
Sure. Um, and if we haven't already, I want to make sure that um, we put the Wolf Moose Project link in the chat for people to learn more about that project. Um, and then I, I want to make sure, too, that I uh, set aside some time to throw it over to Ian to let Ian ask some questions. But Sarah, just one more thing that I was curious. So it, when I was sort of researching and planning out um, this watch party, I saw that you uh, recently worked on a story for Michigan Tech about M93. So for people who are like, what the heck is that? Can you tell us? <laughs> who M93 is and tell us a little bit about sort of like, you know, what are, what are your findings and what was sort of like the, the high, the high view or overview um, of that piece? Yeah. So M93 was a very special wolf. He um, came over from Canada across an ice bridge that connected Canada to the mainland in about 1996, 1997. And at that time, the wolf population was the on our role was doing very poorly. It suffered from uh, the, the population was very inbred. As Rolf mentioned in the feature, the wolves had these unusually shaped bones in their spines and things like that. And because the wolf population was suffering from what we call inbreeding depression, it meant that the rate that wolves were preying on moose was getting lower and lower. And when M93 arrived, he wasn't related to any of the other wolves on the island. He's also much bigger. And so he kind of rescued the population temporarily. Um, he became one of the breeding males of one of the three packs, which initially reduced levels of inbreeding in the population. Um, and kind of he brought some new genes to the population that weren't present previously and basically reinvigorated the health of the, the the wolf population. And as M93's genes spread throughout the population, we saw an increase in the rate that wolves were preying on moose. So they basically were able to get back to their, their former glory of being the top predators in the system. However, after about a decade, because M93 was such a successful breeder, he soon became related to most of the other wolves in the population and he start his offspring started breeding with each other and so inbreeding resumed and so we saw a decline in that individual's genes in the population um and also with the resumption of severe inbreeding the rate that wolves were preying on moose started to decline again and those big changes in um the, the rate the wolves were preying on moose obviously had a big impact on the number of moose on the island and in turn that big shift in the number of moose on the island impacted the forest as well because moose are really large animals they can they weigh over 800 pounds and they can browse up to 40 pounds of vegetation a day so when you have big changes in large animals like that it can really start to impact the forest Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. And I also want to make sure that we drop a link to um, to Sarah's story into the chat for folks who are learning a little or interested in learning more about M93. Um, and yeah, at this point, I, I want to throw it over to Ian and give Ian an opportunity to kind of sit in the, the interviewer chair um, in case there are any questions that you want to ask Sarah or Ian um, or Sarah or Rolf rather. Um, one thing though, I, I feel like I just want to kind of hone in on what Sarah just said is like Ian and I can both yes the the moose are huge what you just said Sarah about them being 800 pounds like I feel like it was also my first time seeing a moose out in the wild and I was like holy smokes they are tall and huge and like kind of just like overwhelming to to be close to and to see um so I just want to throw that in there but yeah with that Ian I, I really want to hand it over to you to let you ask these guys a couple questions if you'd like yeah, absolutely. And ditto. I'm I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> the the um I just remember turning that one corner and that moose coming on the trail. It was just an incredible moment. And, but for Sarah and Rolf, I really just want to know on a personal level, this research is so important. It's internationally known. It's, you know, Rolf, you've been doing it for at this point decades on decades. Like what does it feel like to be involved in such like important and specific research like this and to know that, you know, kind of the world's watching? Well, I, I do have a sense that I shouldn't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be sure we take full advantage of this opportunity because we are in a very privileged situation. And if we don't do it, uh, you know the, the opportunity passes us by so there but it doesn't 
it doesn't weigh heavily on my shoulders on a day-to-day -day basis because there's so much to do and to get right that uh, that, that keeps me busy. <laughs> Amazing. How about you, Sarah? Um, yeah, I, I, I just to probably echo a lot of what Ralph said, it really is a privilege to, to be part of this project. Um, but with that privilege does come responsibilities. There's decades worth of data that has to be managed and and things like that. Um, but it, it's a privilege as well because we have so much data going back such a long way. Any new findings that we have, you know, with these newly reintroduced walls, we have so much context that we can put those new results in. And so we're really, really kind of, I see it as every year we're trying to figure out another little link in the relationship between the different species and the ecosystems and things like that as well. So yeah, it's, and like Rolf says, you, you can't think about these things too much because you're so busy with all the day-to-day the -day business. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like an absolute honor to be invited into this research, to hear it from the people who are doing it directly. Um, Rolf, please tell Candy I say hello as well. It was <laughs> it was an honor to be you know welcomed into your home. You guys have there amazing hospitality. <laughs> oh, hello! <laughs> yep, so still good here. to see you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank cool. you guys so much. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow, that just made me really happy getting to see Candy for a moment <laughs> there. So, um, I, I want to ask both of you, Sarah and Rolf, to sort of close us out here. Um, obviously, you know, like winter is coming. I know that, like, way up in the Kiwana, um, I, I think I heard there's actually some snow there right now. So, I wonder, um, gearing up for the winter portion of this study, um, Rolf, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about, you know. We, we were able to kind of showcase some of what the island um, looks like and feels like in the summertime, but tell us a little bit about the work that you all have ahead of you for the winter season. I guess I'm going to be preoccupied for the next couple of months on the weather. So uh, because we have to fly out there in January and we don't know how much ice there is mm -hmm. and we have to land a plane on, on snow covered ice. And so we're kind of guessing on whether we have four or five inches of, of ice under that snow. So, and it's, wow. and it's very rare that we get a satellite view of the place in December because it's shrouded in clouds. So I guess I'm, I'll be preoccupied with that. And, and we've got all the supplies out there pretty much already. So it's just a matter of getting there safely and getting going. Okay. All right. And Sarah, what about from your view, where are you at in sort of the winter prep? Yeah, well, we have to do a, a lot of, we try and do a lot of it before the last boat goes across, because obviously it's a lot easier to move equipment on the boat. So we've already been sending all the supplies that we need for collecting samples and things like that as well. Um, but we'll be, you know, printing off data sheets and things like that. Um, because we do it kind of year after year, you kind of get dialed in with exactly what gear that you can you can take and, and fit in the planes and things like that. Um, but really, yeah, just trying to make sure because you're you're out there for a seven week period, make sure you finish all the other bits of work that you need to do. And um, I also teach that semester as well. So that's kind yeah. of challenging to organize that and and do some lessons from the island. Um, in between survey flights so that's always a challenge but fun oh my gosh yeah i mean uh for the sake of transparency, when I was talking with Sarah before we did this episode premiere party, I was like, Sarah, shamelessly, I just have to ask, what are the logistics like for trying to get a journalist out in the winter? And Sarah, you told me, you were like, well, uh, you got to prepare to be out there for potentially seven weeks. So that's something to take into account. Um, so, wow. I mean, the work that you all do, clearly there's so much dedication involved. And I would echo Ian's sentiments, just that both of us are so grateful. Um, we do have a question and I'll throw this one to Ralph coming in from Teresa. Um, Teresa says, very interesting. Would they introduce a new male wolf into the island? Would that help? So um, I wonder, Ralf, like if you can answer Teresa's question. And I sort of am curious, like at what point do you determine that maybe a new male wolf needs to be introduced? What are the kind of like factors that you're taking into account there? Yeah, and this, this is a decision that's ultimately the responsibility of the National Park Service. Um, 
and uh, they they were in charge of an effort that brought in 19 new wolves. Uh, but I think they would like to introduce more genetic variety. But there's a there's a serious problem in that the wolves may not uh, share that opinion. <laughs> so newcomers are are at great risk of being killed, and so that's that's a, a dilemma that I expect to be discussed and thought about for uh, years years to come. I don't think it would happen very quickly, but the Park Service does have an interest in diversifying that gene pool. Mm -hmm. And the wolves didn't really exactly cooperate in uh, maximizing genetic variability. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it is about that time to wrap up another Great Lakes Now episode watch party, this time an episode premiere party at a slightly different time. So I really appreciate folks uh, bearing with us through that change in scheduling and for tuning in and as always bringing a lot of enthusiasm and really thoughtful questions and comments into the conversation. And make sure that you head over to greatlakesnow.org for all kinds of cool extras and other segments and content related to the new episode titled Wild Islands and Salty Visitors. Also, a big thank you to my guests today. Let's bring them all out again. We have Rolf Peterson, who is researcher and professor emeritus for Michigan Tech's College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science. Rolf is the co-lead on the world's longest running wildlife study, the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project. Rolf, it was really great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And then we have Sarah Hoy, of course, wildlife researcher at Michigan Tech University's College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science. Sarah is the co-lead on the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project. Sarah, thank you so much for lending your time and expertise with us. No, you're very welcome. It's been fun. And then we have Ian Solomon, Great Lakes Now contributor, founder of Amplify Outside, and one of my favorite people to work with. Ian, thank you so much for making yourself available to join the conversation. Of course. Thank you. I always love being a part of it. Oh, it's so good to have you here. And Karen says, thank you so much for inviting us to this wonderfully informative event. The work you do is amazing. Karen, thank you so much. And with that, Dean, let's pull up the map graphic here so I can give a warm thank you to all of our wonderful co-hosts for this event. We have Detroit Public Television, of course, WNMU-TV in Marquette, Michigan, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, WPBS-TV in Watertown, New York. We have the Michigan Learning Channel, Planet Detroit, and Michigan Tech College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science. We have also been streaming on our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. I also want to make sure that we thank our wonderful team at Detroit Public Television. We have Dean Underwood, who has been holding it down behind the scenes for us tonight. We have Colleen O'Donnell, Lana Contardi, Neela Murray, Jordan Wingrove, Rob Green. Thank you so much for another really fun Great Lakes Now episode premiere watch party. And until next time, we will see you out on the lakes. <laughs>